No, um, there's, a, there's a classic method of meditation which is adopted in our Lutheran tradition that I'll come back to. Um, it's a way of meditating on Jesus using gospel stories. Now the basic presupposition of this form of meditation is that Jesus who was there 2,000 years ago is with us here and now. Number one. Um, number two, um, the way to do this meditation is to use your imagination to envisage Jesus here now. To paint the picture. So the way you do this is to, in your mind's eye, paint the picture, the story that's being told here. Um, to identify yourself with the people in the story. And the story I'm going to look at, a very short story, there's a woman here that I want you to identify yourself with. Put yourself in her shoes. Imagine Jesus here, and you're this woman, and you come to Jesus. Why do you come to Jesus? Why do you say what this woman says? And then hear this word as being spoken to you. Okay? Um, I'll have more to say about that form of meditation. It's a very simple form of meditation which uh, uh, most Christians do automatically when they read the Gospels. It's a simple little incident from Luke chapter 11. Where we read this. As he, that's Jesus, said this, so it's Jesus teaching. That's the context. And there's a crowd around Jesus, he's teaching. So this is group here, Jesus in the midst. As he said this, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts that you sucked. But he, Jesus said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it, retain it. Okay? Do your meditation. I'm going to be very rude and interrupt your meditation and then carry it on. Okay, this woman here, that's you. You're this woman. What kind of a woman are you? Why do you react in this way to Jesus? Hey, what kind of a woman? Now, paint a picture. Is she a young woman? She old woman. What kind of woman is? I, I see her as an older woman. Why? Particularly because she's a mother. She is a, obviously a mother. And um, okay, now uh, being a mother uh, touches human beings most deeply. I don't think there's anything that, from a natural point of view, that affects human beings as deeply as by becoming a mother. Being a father, and I've been a father hasn't affected me half the way becoming a mother as my wife. Okay, okay, so she's a mother. What kind of a mother is she? What kind of a person? What? So she's an older woman. She's obviously a mother. What kind of a mother is, her? is she? Anything else about her? You know, make an identical picture so you can identify with her. I think she's a really caring mother who really deeply somehow is connected with his motherhood. She's not just, I don't think she would have just had a child and then thought, no. oh well, but she's quite really connected to this. How do you know that? Yes, she's, she's, she's a, a, a maternal character. You know, there's some women who have children and then pass on. For other women, being a mother is part of their being. And why do you say that, Maria? Because of the words she says. Yes, like which ones? 
Well, she used the word womb and breast, and it's kind of so earthy. Yes. Connected. Yes. It's, it's, it's the two basic things, just womb and breast. Now, you've got to realize this is an ancient society. We can use the words womb and breast these days without <gasps> shock. But uh, where would you talk in ancient society about womb and breasts? In a woman with other women. You only yeah, talk about the fact that she raised her voice. Yeah. She's, she's obviously either wanting a point to, um, point to prove or is known to be outspoken, but it doesn't appear to be that in any yeah. other way. No, she's not making a display of herself. Um, Okay, so she's, uh, it's, 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 it's very stark kind of language. To talk like this means that it's something very deep for her. I don't know what kind of, uh, it, it, this is so stark, you see, that many translations, I don't know whether, whether you realise it, actually iron this out. They don't refer to breasts and sucking breasts, but just, um, uh, uh, blessed, hmm? One says that nursed you. That nursed you. Birth yeah, you see, it's euphemistic, but here, this is, the, um, and it's interesting, there are American translations, and by the way, Americans are much more prudish than Australians, I think, on this kind of thing. It's, it's very stark. Okay, anything else about it then? Okay, yeah, sorry? She must have been German, sorry. She must have been German because she's direct. Okay, so, well, like a German, even if she wasn't German. My, uh, yes, Chris? Um, I actually got a feeling from her that um, she yep. was actually disappointed in what her kids have. Why do you know that? Because yeah. for, for a woman of that culture to express herself in that way, um, it, she's saying that your mother is so blessed to have you as a son. Yeah, because she is the kind of, I mean, he's the kind of son that she... I that I wanted, but didn't get. But also, she's blaming herself partly because, yes. because here she's not crediting Jesus, but crediting the mother. Yeah. The mother. So the focus is not on Jesus, but on yes. Mary. So for which, her screw up kids, she's blaming herself. That's well, whether it's blaming or not, but there is something, this, yeah. this a, ambiguous feelings there. Isn't that a... Yeah, yeah. It's a backhanded compliment. It's a backhanded compliment, all right? Isn't, isn't that a natural feeling? Like, I don't know, because yes. I don't have kids. Yes. Yes. Up. Yes. But um, if your kids are messed up, you you still blame yourself. If always you do, you. always yeah. do, always do. Um, now, there's two things uh, that go with motherhood. One is that you're always a mother. You, you know, even when your kids grow up, you it's something that changes you at a very deep level by becoming a mother, and you never cease to be a mother. Um, uh, and secondly. Um, uh, you, ca you, you, you can't distance yourself from your children. Either they're successes or they're failures. And you, so the blame comes automatically with it. Okay, a disappointed mother. I, I don't know what, uh, do you find her reference to womb and breasts offensive, Tom? It is a bit in the face. It's yeah. always bits of the body that you don't need to talk about. It is, yes. Touchy. It's a bit touchy. But um, and because it's touchy, it evokes powerful emotions. I don't know whether, whether it is with all of you, but both of those, womb, breasts, they're very, uh, feminine. Like it's they're very feminine. They define the essence of being a woman. But in using those words, there's no am ambiguity. That's right. It it's going to be passed to the father that it was someone else other than... I mean, the womb that bore you, there's only... Every person only has one womb. One womb, yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Like Chris again? I was just going to ask, though, in the Greek, isn't that um, word nurse... Isn't, it can be used as suck, but it's used as nurse as well. Well, it's the same thing. It's... it's, it's so is, that, is that... It means... What does it mean? It means breastfeeding. And, and that was, That's the word in Greek for breastfeeding. Yeah, and that wasn't talked about, it was only talked about between females and stuff? Yeah, normally speaking, yes, yes. Oh, the, the, it wouldn't have had the same taboo about breastfeeding, I don't think, that we have um, in our society. Um, but referring to womb, okay, that's... Uh, that's secret women's business. That's definitely women's business. You just don't talk about this. Uh, yes? She's the sort of person that would be prepared to follow Christ around to look after him. Yep. And that was, and she would be content 
to serve Christ and to hear and in that obedience. Yeah, because what would she want to do with Jesus? What? Mother him. She want to mother him. And um, look, after him. look after him. Yeah, he's he's serve him because um, you know she. Uh, she knows her place in life. Yeah, sorry, what? She knows her place in life. Okay. It's not a frontline position, but no. as a mother, she cares. And it's very important to her. And this is the best thing that she could do. Okay. Now, I, I um, there's a lot here. This this is what this is a very powerful little exchange. So um, uh, what? Who is she congratulating? Blessed is the womb that bore your breasts up? Mary. Mary, and because Mary is the mother of our Lord, she it says she is blessed. Blessed in what sense? What does it mean, blessed? Does it mean just lucky? Someone who received special favour. Special favour from God. So she is a recipient of God's blessing. Now, um, then look at what Jesus says. Is he rude to her? Blessed rather. What does that rather imply? No, at least. Is, it he, is he saying, my mother is not blessed because she bore me? No, no it's funny that also yes. that um, if we think of an example of someone who hears the word and keeps it, Mary is actually on a high. Okay, just put that, put that aside because I want to come back to that. Of, of, uh, more question, of more importance is this. Yeah, she's saying, okay, yes, she is blessed, but there is something, there's a, somebody else who is more. more blessed. Okay, and just bear in mind what you said about her and her mothering desire and you know, her disappointment. Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. What she compare, what's Jesus comparing here? Oh, I Sorry? I got the picture of comparing holding on to a child and holding on to the word of God. But holding, so uh, he, first of all, Jesus compares, is it the breast first that he compares with, the word with? Word. Notice, hearing the word and keeping it. Why these two? Hearing and keeping. So, uh, what's the point of comparison? Uh, what does Jesus compare to the womb and the breasts? It's in the secondary sense, but in the literal sense it is? Yeah. The Word of God. So the Word of God is compared to a womb. And the Word of God is compared to breasts that feed a baby. So there's two pictures here. There's, there's a picture of pregnancy and there's a picture of breastfeeding and the connection is the word of God. Yes, Chris? I was going to say in a way um, you hear in the same uh, can be related to the receiving into the word. Yes. Um, you're receiving the word of God into you. Okay. And so keeping the word of God is like breastfeeding, nursing a baby. Nourishing. You've got it. Okay, so uh, in what way is the word like the womb? Because the word gives life to you and me. When you receive it. When you receive it. Do you know how Mary became pregnant? Through the ear. Um, and you get funny medieval pictures of, you know, quite gruesome ones about her becoming pregnant through the ear. Uh, so the word of God makes, uh, produces what in us? Life. Life in us. We might even go a little bit further than that. And the Word of God not only produces life in us, gives rebirth, to, not birth, but rebirth to us, the Word of God also does what? Nourishes. Nourishes us. Nourishes us like a baby. Okay, you get the basic point of comparison there? So, um, uh, hearing is compared to bearing and keeping is compared to sucking. Now, anything else that you get from this? Now, I can see people going, there. yes, first of all, you? Um, while Christ doesn't deny that Mary was blessed, yes. that blessing is for one person only, there is a blessing he is pronouncing. Okay, this is a blessing that applies to everybody. So, is he putting her down? No. 
What is he in fact saying to this woman who feels disappointed? You too, are, in fact, you are blessed more than the person. You are more blessed than my mother. my mother as my mother. Why? Because she's a disciple. So she is more blessed than Mary as the mother of Jesus. Okay, so he's not putting her down. And is she the only one that's blessed then? then all disciples are more blessed than Mary, the mother of Jesus. That's one level. But in fact, it's not quite that simple, Tom, because what? Mary is the pinnacle of keeping or hearing the word of God and holding it. Okay. She is the uh, master <laughs> or mistress, I'd say, of meditation. This has to do with meditation. Um, uh, she is the guru, if you like, the, the type of meditation and she's doubly blessed because not only is she the physical mother of our Lord but she's also what? the first disciple of our Lord and so she is doubly blessed do you get the basic way it works? now anything else about it? yep the great emphasis of that second line of verse 28 yes um it's got such thrust to it because we we you underline here yes. hearing, yes. but that means so much more than just coming in. Oh, that's the right. Ears. So the hearing and the keeping, um, it, it's just got such force to me. Yes, uh, it's really just nailing it. Yes. So God. so what kind what kind of hearing is it? It's keeping hearing. What kind of keeping is it? Hearing keeping. So hearing's not just something that is at one point, but it's ongoing, keeping, retaining. Um, unlike pregnancy, which ends, there's, there's no uh, point in which you get a delivery, if you like, at this point. Anything else on this powerful little thing that strikes you meditating? Yes? Just also that um, I know in at least the Latin texts often that Breasts and sucking has to do with education. That's yes. Like Educare is often yes. the word used for it. Yes. And so it's a symbol not just for the, you know, however long you're breastfeeding for, yes. but for a much greater rearing um, kind of period. Medieval paintings, you get uh, Bibles like that. And I remember when I saw it the first time, I couldn't make sense of it. You had a person here. And you had a book there, and you had a funny little protuberance there. Right? Oh, it is a breast on. What's the point it's making? Sucking the nourishment out of the wood. Now, sucking the nourishment out of the wood. Now, this is very important for us as Lutherans and for you as theological students because the danger is you look at this, the word for information instead of what? Substance. Life and nourishment. The word isn't there to give you ideas, information, but it's to give you life and to nourish the life. And just as a baby doesn't, doesn't suck mother's breast one point in life, it sucks regularly. I don't get how powerful that image is. Now, um, this one, you know, this, this picture is very common in connection with meditation. With yours, the sucking of the word. Um, sucking, it sounds a bit funny, but it's, uh, uh, it was very, very common in the ancient world, but also in, in depictions of meditation. Maria, and then... Yeah. German universities, they are, they're usually called Alma Mater, yes. the of the towns, which means... The nourishing um, mother, yes. And they're always connected with this picture of a child sucking in the breast. Do you know where they get it from, the German universities? From, from that. From that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, this is because universities were Christian institutions, and this is, it, it's, it shows the background of that. People don't even think of it anymore, but that's the imagery there. Yes, Julie? It's also a progression of growth. Yes. Um, very much so, you know, um, a baby's in the womb to grow. But once it's out, I mean, the, the growth is continual. Yes. Which is symbolic still of the, the line underneath, the hearing the word of God and keeping it. So yes. It's still the symbolism of it's 
the continual growth. The continual ongoing growth and, and life. It's not that you get life once and then you don't need to receive life. The word is at the same time always life-giving, always nourishing. Um, and if you become disconnected from the word, what happens then? You don't just aren't just malnourished, but you are you die spiritually. Um, anything else about this? Now there's another level here that nobody's touched yet. Let's see if you can I think there was one remark that somebody said that um, in what way are we like Mary? Because we, we get to bear Christ. Aha. Uh -huh. Go on, Chris. No, just 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 expand that. Get take that. Out. We get to bear Christ. Yes? Yeah, so um, we have Christ within us. Right, so we have... We get to feed... <laughs> no, it's, it, the picture breaks down then because you can't feed on something that's inside you. Uh, it's something outside. But just as Mary received Christ into her womb, we have Christ into us. And so... It's through hearing the word, meditating on the word, that you get the indwelling of Christ in us. And that's another very ancient picture of meditation. We become pregnant with Christ. And we bear Christ in our bodies. We, we live up to your name. Do you know what your name means? Christ-bearer. Christ-bearer. That's where this... It's this idea that lies behind your name. I don't... This is your... This is your personal text. Uh, Christopher means carrying Christ, not carrying on your back, but carrying Christ inside you, being a Christ bearer. Okay, anything else on this? Just that those, like, priests were born, um, in a lot of, like, uh, symbolism, Romulus and Remus, yes. and also all these other totem poles or whatever, like nourishing. Yes. yes. And, um, but it's always from a person or an animal or something. Where yes. This is an interesting kind of twist in Yes. Uh, nourishment from a word. From a word. Yeah. Yes. So it, uh, probably like in the ancient world, people that would have sparked off a yep. bit of a countercultural. Well, is this is about. this is very countercultural, and I can't go into it because there's lots of background stuff. Like what what scripture does is takes common imagery and turns it around. Right? It takes common pictures and turns them around like that. Um, now, uh, there's somebody else that picked up this. An another point, blessed are those who hear the word of God. The word of God can be God's words, but who is the word of God? Jesus. Jesus. Notice that double reference. Was it you, Chris, who mentioned that? Yeah. Uh, who hear the word of God means not just hearing what God says, or what Jesus says, but hearing Jesus. The word of God. That Jesus coming into us. That's the way that fits. And, and keeping Jesus then... Uh, the idea is that if you stop hearing the word, you lose Jesus. Uh, and it's not enough just to hear, but you need to keep, retain it, so that the word can do its work in you. Uh, any other uh, ideas there? I'd just be interested to know if you recommend any good um, papers to read on this passage as a meditation, if you know of any books that pick it up. Oh gosh, no, I, <laughs> yes, Grace upon Grace. <laughs> I, 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 um, uh, look, far better than taking secondary stuff. Just work. Just learn to do it. You, well, one of the problems that I find with meditations, devotions, is that somebody else is doing it for me. Um, instead of just letting it happen, one of the things about meditation is letting the gift of meditation, letting it happen to you rather than work at it. Um, so what? Uh, Say what I did the first time I had a close look at this was just to focus on this for a day almost. It was a, um, a retreat that this was given to me. And a whole day I, I just sat with this and identified myself with this woman. And I uh, imagined her. I'm, what's important to, for you blokes is not just to imagine what she says and does, but imagine how she feels. Feeling is as much a part of meditation as thinking, imagining, sensing. Um, classical teachers of meditation say, uh, uh, say the Ignatian method would be to take this story and then first of all to, uh, to use all your five senses. To see it, 
to smell it, to taste it, to touch it, to, and then most importantly, to hear. So in physical involvement with all four senses, then you get emotional involvement, in intellectual involvement, imaginative involvement at all levels. Now, each one of us will come differently. So um, uh, can you think of automatically who would hear this story differently? Mothers would hear it differently from you who are not yet mothers, but you'd hear it differently too. Males. And you could, you, could do, you could do a sample meditation and write up and you could show how a woman would automatically um, lock into one, one aspect of this story. Maria? Julie? This maternal side. And what about the idea of motherhood? The picture of a pregnant woman, the picture of a mother breastfeeding a baby. Would that be the first thing you should do? I don't think so. I ran this past my wife. She said, automatically, the first thing that comes to her would be feeling. What it feels like to be pregnant. What it feels like to breastfeed somebody. What it feels like to have a son. Oh, and by the way, your firstborn son is always special for any woman. And I don't know why. Nobody has yet been able to explain that um, firstborn son, very strange, interesting, complicated relationship. Okay. Anything else on that before I move on? Yes. The one of the nature of bearing and resting a child. Yes. Ongoing yep. That's right. That's right. And whereas this, that's just once off, limited, growing up, growing out. Baby grows up, mother stops. And one of the problems with mothers is that you, uh, you even though you never stop being a mother, you've got to stop mothering. mothering. And that is so painful to stop mothering um, and yet remain a mother. Yes. Can you just very, very quickly so tell me one thing that's been turned on its head here? Because I, I didn't quite get you said this before. It's turned something on its head. Uh, wondering you know, what that is at all. Um, uh, what it's, it's this, fo this part is fairly conventional. Um, and you get pictures of, uh, you know, uh, no, uh, breastfeeding women, pregnant women, you get these pictures everywhere in all societies, you know, big woman pregnant breastfeeding. Um, and it usually has to do with, uh, uh, sorry? Fertility? It has to do with fertility. So you get, it's normally has to do with fertility. Now, um, what happens here is that it's got nothing to do with fertility. And it, it's, it's turned around because the focus is not on, um, it has to do with femininity and fertility. They are the two stock uh, things. Uh, can you see here, it, it, it's, it's shifted from a woman to, to the Word of God to Jesus, male. So it's taking, it's appropriating feminine symbolism for Jesus and it's um, connecting these two powerful images with speaking of all activities. Now, nowhere in the ancient world do I know um, that there is any connection between uh, speaking and these pictures. Huh? Can you see how it's turned? But the most powerful is takes fertility symbolism, which is very, very religious, very powerful in all society, and um, uh, disconnects it from natural physical fertility and um, from natural femininity. And, and uh, it brings about a new kind of femininity. What does it make all of us then? Which sex? Women. Women. Church. Right? Eh? That it makes us, and that's why I said, you blokes, this, this is a very good kind of meditation for males because it, it means that you spiritually have to see yourself in feminine, maternal terms. It also speaks, though, too, of the greatest, the two, the greatest kind of intimacy. 
that's, oh, yes. There is nothing more intimate than those two. So it's the deepest intimacy uh, that any human being ever experiences on the physical level, pregnancy. And uh, there's another intimacy which is different because there's a different because you can't see. You have a limited sense connection with a pregnant, ba I mean, with a baby. But uh, there's something extraordinary, provided it's not complicated, and there are other complications with breastfeeding and the closeness and the intimacy um, at all levels that is between a mother and a breastfeeding baby. Which some of you, oh, not many of you know. <laughs> some of you know from second hand. None of you know. Okay, let's, anything else before I move on? <laughs> okay. Us thick blokes. Uh, now, uh, maybe it helps to be Scottish and wear skirts. Maybe then. Sorry, what? Maybe it helps to be Scottish and wear skirts. <laughs> then you get yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it softens the macho kind of thing. Uh, but it, it can. <laughs> what it is is connects. Can I repeat? It connects discipleship with femininity uh, in a very powerful way. Now, what are the precept? So, Christian meditation, the techniques of Christian meditation don't differ from any other form of meditation. Um, Christian methods of meditation don't differ from, say, Hindu or Buddhist or um, psychological forms of meditation. The methods are the same. What makes Christian meditation different is not how you do it, but what you meditate on, which is Jesus and his word. Now, um, uh, there are three things that are presupposed in the Christian practice of meditation. First of all, the presence of the risen Lord Jesus. Jesus says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Lo, I am with you always. Now, for Christian meditation to work the way it is, you presuppose the presence of Jesus. So we don't imagine what isn't the case. What we do is we imagine what we know to be true, is that Jesus is with us. That's number one, the presence of the risen Lord. The second thing that Christian meditation presupposes is the power of the Word of God. What's the difference between human words and the words of Jesus? Is that the words of Jesus are full of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says in John chapter 6, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Now what does Jesus mean when he says to us, the words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life? So the words bring the Holy Spirit. They are spirit filled. They are spirit conveying words. And what does the Spirit do when we hear Jesus speaking, he gives what kind of life? Eternal life. God's life, divine life, not human life. So he doesn't make us sort of superhuman, like a kind of taking Viagra or something like that, or some drug. It's not physical life, but it is eternal life. It does something to us. It's powerful. Uh, it's effectual. It brings the Holy Spirit let me just share with you part of Luther's introduction to the large catechism. And there's, it's, this is just typical Luther, who, who has a better sense for this than any other teacher that I know. Um, uh, he's talking about meditation. Now, meditation on God's Word and God's Word uh, in, the, in connection with the catechism. So, Ten Commandments, the Gospel, Lord's Prayer. In such reading, conversation, and meditation, the Holy Spirit is present and bestows ever new and greater light and devotion so that it, God's Word, tastes better. You get that picture again? Tasting the Word. No, better and better and is digested, assimilated, as Christ also promises in Matthew 18, verse 20, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Nothing is so powerful, powerfully effective against the devil, the world, the flesh, and all evil thoughts 
as to occupy oneself, that's another term for meditation, it's Old Testament term, meditate, to speak to yourself the word, to occupy yourself, to occupy oneself with God's word, to speak about it to yourself and to meditate on it in the way that some one calls those blessed who meditate on God's law, God's teaching, day and night. Without doubt, you will offer up a more powerful incense or savour, that smell, against the devil than uh, no more powerful instance than to occupy yourself with God's commandments and words and to si speak, sing and think about them. Indeed, this is the true holy water and sign that drives away the devil and puts him to flight. For he cannot bear to hear God's word. And God's word is the power of God. He's quoting Paul in uh, Romans and 1 Corinthians. Indeed, the power of God that burns the devil's house down and gives us immeasurable strength and comfort and help. Now, notice here that Luther doesn't emphasize the cognitive, intellectual side of reading, meditating on the Word of God, but the, what uh, scholars call the affective side of it, the way it affects you and works on your whole being. Um, so, meditation is letting the Word take its effect on you. There's three wonderful pictures here that he has. Notice it has to do with spiritual warfare. The first picture uses, he says, it's the best incense that you can use. You need to realize that in the Middle Ages, incense was used, burnt to drive the devil away. He says, oh, he doesn't... He doesn't say that's not the case. He says this is far better than any incense that you can burn to drive the devil and his stink away from you. The second picture is he uses holy water. You need to realize, and you still see it in many Catholic churches, you come in, you dip your finger in holy water, water that's used for baptism too, and you make the sign of the cross with holy water. He says, what's better than any holy water to drive the devil away? The Word of God. Um, and what does the uh, Word of God do with the devil's house? It burns it down. <laughs> it puts it... Because why? Because the Word of God is so powerful spiritually. It brings the Holy Spirit. It drives the devil away. It enlightens you and makes you, you, fills your heart with devotion. It gives you immeasurable strength, comfort, and notice the practical thing? Help. Fire is a good image too. Yes. It? Well, it's two ways. What it does is lights you up, sets you, warms you. I'll come back to the image of light and uh, fire. But it also burns out what's evil in you and burns the, the devil's ha house down, not around you, but burns out the devil's house in you so that there's no place for the devil to <clears throat> dwell in you. So that's what Luther's thinking. He burns the house of the devil out of you. Reforms the dross. Sorry? Reforms the dross. It refines all that kind of stuff. Right. Um, that's the second uh, a presupposition for meditation is the power of the Word of God and the fact that the Holy Spirit comes through the Word. In recent times, there's been a lot of talk about receiving the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Spirit. Now, most people think being filled with the Spirit is something that happens once in your life. If you take this through, then why, if you think that Luther here is speaking about meditation, how, how often do you receive the Holy Spirit? Continually every day. And how can you be sure it's the Holy Spirit you are receiving? It's by meditating on the Word of God because the Word is the means of the Spirit. Where we in faith engage with, where the Word comes into our heart, there the Holy Spirit is at work. The Holy Spirit is given. The Holy Spirit does the Spirit's work on us. The third thing, and this is uniquely Lutheran, the first two is just classical um, Christian tradition that you'll find all in the Fathers and in the early monastic tradition. The third one is 
uh, Luther's own experience. Now, he was taught to meditate in the monasteries, but he found out that there was a problem um, with all his meditation, because the more he focused on the Word of God, the more the Word did what to him? Convicted him. It convicted him of sin and darkness. So much so that instead of the Word filling him with love for God, he hated God. Why? Because God was digging up the dirt in him and showing that the problem with him wasn't just his evil thoughts and words and desires, but that he was a sinner. Um, now, as you know from your church history, the breakthrough came not by study of the Bible, not by theological reflection, but through meditation. He was meditating on the phrase, the righteousness of God, day and night. That's an echo Psalm 1, meditating. He was meditating on the, that word, the righteousness of God, day and night. And then all of a sudden, heaven was opened before him. Why? And what happened? What did that word do? Speak to him. Whereas previously he had heard the, the phrase, the righteousness of God as a demand, Luther, you've got to be righteous if you want to be with God. What does he hear it for the first time? As gospel. God saying, I have justified you. My righteousness comes to you as a gift. And he says then that heaven was open before him. Uh, subjectively exper he experienced justification. Um, you see, if I have a bad conscience, if I have a bad conscience and I start reading this, how will I read this? I'll, all I hear is law, law, law. And it's only if I have a good conscience will I hear, I don't stop hearing the law, I'll still hear law, and I'll hear the law far more clearly than ever before, but what will I hear as well? gospel. Um, and so justification is, and faith, is the presupposition for um, meditation. You won't love the law of God, you won't love God's word, unless you are, have the assurance of salvation, unless you have a good conscience. Um, so Paul in Romans 5 says, therefore being justified by grace through our Lord Jesus Christ, we have peace with God through whom we have gained access to the grace in which we now stand. It's only because we're justified that we have peace with God, a good conscience, and that means that we come to God to receive grace rather than receiving judgment, condemnation. So there's a very close connection in our Lutheran tradition between justification and meditation. Can I emphasize again, the, the so-called breakthrough of Luther was not a basically a theological breakthrough. It's not a systematic thing. It's not even an exegetical breakthrough. It is, has to do with spirituality. It has to do with meditation and the practice of meditation and meditating on the Word of God. Um, yeah, we had a look at that. Now, I'll, we'll have a, a break yeah, we'd better have a break then and I'll continue this.